This is part four in my series of, of whether or not uh, speaking in tongues is required for entry into heaven. And I'm just going to take off where I ended in, in part three and go into the book of Acts. But first, just uh, talk about the main point that, that uh, this person on YouTube has commented about this subject by saying that the sign of speaking in other tongues was only given to the first century Jews and the apostles to let them know that the Samaritans and the Gentiles um, were now could now get saved. So this person is saying that that the, the the sign of speaking in other tongues was not to let them know that they had been filled with the Holy Spirit, but actually to let them know that they now could get saved to confirm that they're now allowed into the covenant with the Jews, the believing Jews. So. Uh, to deal with that subject, there's so much that can could, could be talked about. Uh, they bring up Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 10. And I want to deal with two, two, uh, two main points that they discuss in those chapters that I think is in error. And until we see the error in, in, in that mindset of, of uh, thinking, uh, we really can't uh, go any further in discussion. And... In Acts chapter 8, about that whole passage, this person writes that the Samaritans get saved, but they don't receive the Holy Ghost, which is why Peter and John ran, ran down so they could receive the Holy Ghost. And once they receive the Holy Ghost and start speaking in other tongues, now Peter and John know beyond a shadow of a doubt the Samaritans are saved and can enter the new covenant. So... That uh, that looking at it like that is looking at it through your preconceived ideas and teach things that you've learned through the years, rather than just reading it as the Word of God speaks to you. Nowhere does it say that the the Samaritans were saved before they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Nowhere in the Word of God can someone be saved before they're filled with the Holy Ghost. And this is why I don't like using the word saved. The Bible doesn't use the word saved. Like, oh, when were you saved? It, 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 Jesus specifically says a man must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. He then, and that's in John 3.3. 3. He then expounds upon that and says a man must be born of the water and the spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. So we know that, you, um, that a new birth needs to happen. And then that, and that new birth isn't just um, baptism in water. But it's baptism in water and baptism with the Holy Spirit. And that encompasses one new birth. Just like uh, when we're born, a baby um, in the womb has not yet been born, even if it starts going through the birth canal. Until it's fully through the birth canal, comes completely out of the birth canal, and then takes its first um, uh, breath of, of, of air outside the birth canal, canal that, that would be considered a full birth. But to say that a baby's born when it's still in the birth canal, it is not a, a, a valid use of the term born. To be born is to actually come into this world, to c go completely through the birth canal and take your first breath of air. So same with uh, to be born again, the new birth. You need to repent of your sins, turn from them, turn towards Jesus, recognize what he's accomplished uh, for you through his death, burial, re and resurrection. Know who Jesus is. Many people don't even know who Jesus is according to what the Word of God says. And I'm going to do a video on that uh, shortly that really uh, delves deep into who Jesus is, who, the, who the, the Bible says Jesus really is. And when we know who Jesus is, um, we get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We get baptized into his death knowing that because he resurrected, when we're baptized into his death, we put on Christ in water baptism. We come up out of that water having his resurrection life upon our lives. So there's a spiritual resurrection that takes place, but it, that promises us a physical resurrection on the last day when the Lord returns. So we need to take part in the first resurrection, which happens in water baptism. In order to, to take part in uh, the resurrection unto life on the last day. So we look to Jesus and all that he accomplished. We get baptized into his death after we repent of our sins. And then we need to receive the seal of promise. We need to be baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And the sign that we're filled, according to the word of God, is that we'll begin speaking in other tongues. Now, if we let man's teachings, doctrines, things from history that have, have been in error, and we look to people and men from the past, uh, we want to label them church fathers, whatever, and we look to them instead of the apostles and prophets and what they taught, they, they said, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, we're in error now because we're going to be trusting on man, not God. And those men could have a lot of truth in what they say, but we don't. We can't take them as word of God truth. However, we can take the apostles as word of God truth because what they said, what they wrote is written in God's word. And so uh, with that being said, you cannot be saved with, without being born again. You must be born again in order to be saved. So in Acts chapter 8, we see that... Uh, they weren't born, uh, born of the Spirit. They had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet, even though they had received the Word of God through repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So yes, they had been born of water, but they still needed to be born of Spirit in order to be born again. And that's critical, because this person set, made, a, made a statement that's in error by saying the Samaritans get saved, but they don't receive the Holy Ghost. No, they're not, they're not saved if, if we're looking at saved as meaning born again. So that's really important. And I'll, I want to go deeper into Acts chapter 8. But first I want to jump back to the Old Testament because many people overlook the Old Testament with regards to speaking in tongues. They, they, they think that it's only written about in the New Testament. And they, they forget that the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church. And that the, uh, the prophets of old foretold of speaking in tongues and, and foretold what it meant. So let's turn to Isaiah 28. And we can start at uh, um, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon, upon line, here a little and there a little. For, and verse 11 is key. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now when it says this people, he's talking about the Jews. With stammering lips and another tongue would, would he, will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So this, uh, when, when, when someone begins speaking in other tongues, that's the refreshing. That's someone getting filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the rest, because that's the Spirit of Christ indwelling a, someone who believes in Jesus, who's repented of their sins, and turn to turn to Jesus. And so, that is so powerful when we recognize that Jesus is our rest and we, re we know that we've entered into that rest, that we've received that promise, His Spirit, um, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And with stammering lips and another tongue, that's uh, the rest that it's saying. That's how you know you've received that rest. And so I think that that's really important to, to recognize. And when we then turn to the book of Acts, we can um, see that in Acts chapter 3, just, just uh, after the day of Pentecost, um, they, Peter and John met some other Jews who they shared the, what happened, how, they, how Jesus was killed. They, they put the, it says in verse 14, that they denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto them. So they, they released a murderer instead of releasing Jesus who was innocent. And they killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead. And his name through faith in his name made that, um, that man strong, the, the lame man um, who, whom Peter in the name of Jesus um, said, rise up and walk. But then... Uh, it continues, it says, And now, brethren, I, I wot that through ignorance you did it, and, all, and did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, 
when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So this times of refreshing, what he's referring to is what uh, was written about in Isaiah 28, 11 and 12. Um, so what he's saying is repent and, and receive remission of sins, which we know is the gospel, Acts 2, 38. And that the times of refreshing will, will come from the presence of the Lord. That's speaking. Of, that's talking about when they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and begin speaking in other tongues, just like Isaiah 28, 12 spoke about. 11 and 12, I should say. And so this, these are important things to remember and not forget because it's so easy to forget what was written about in the Old Testament about these things. And nowhere did it say that that was only for uh, that first century and not for anyone else. It was uh, actually assigned to the Jews about the, uh, the fulfillment of, of, of um, Isaiah's words. They know that. The Jews would know that really well. And today even... When um, people begin speaking in other tongues, let's say a Jew is actually born again. Here's the gospel. Repents, is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and is filled with the Holy Ghost and begins speaking in other tongues. And there's other Jews that have, have witnessed that. that. God's still speaking to them today through stammering lips in another, another tongue. It's really important that we recognize that nowhere has it ceased. And and uh, it, there are Jews being converted the way the Bible says, through being born again under the new covenant, obeying the gospel that, they, that the apostles preached. For both Jew and Gentile need to enter the same way, through Christ. And so when we turn to Acts chapter 8, we're going to deal with the details of that chapter. We need to recognize that uh, this, the, uh, the videos prior to this in this series including the one I did on uh, how being born again is the same as being born of the water and of the Spirit. We need to understand the new birth. We need to understand what being born again means. Um, and that getting saved is such a, a, a loose term today that many people just say, oh, I was saved when I accepted Jesus into my heart, or I was saved on this day. Um, that's when I raised my hand and, and said the sinner's prayer. But nowhere in the Word of God do we see that. Nowhere in the Word of God do we see anything that resembles that. One must be born again in order to be saved. You need to be born again. You can't, you can't just uh, be saved without being born again. And, and so when we recognize that being born of the, uh, uh, again is being born of the water and of the Spirit, until someone is born of the water and the Spirit, they're not born again. And so therefore, if they uh, were to continue... Uh, life without ever getting filled with the Holy Spirit, um, they would not be saved. So, but the good news is, is if you've truly repented of your sins and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins upon your own faith, then you're promised to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I think that many people get, uh, they, fear strikes them if they're not right away filled with the Holy Spirit. They get discouraged. Just no, continue to seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you continue to seek to be filled, know that God, He can see your heart, and He's, he's not going to um, let something happen to you before His work is completed in you. But you need to do your part in seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, casting out all fear, all doubt, um, all, the thing, all the hindrances, which we're going to get into later in this video. So for now, I'll just focus on Acts chapter 8, and this person wanted us to... To, to th or wanted to, me to see that in, in that chapter, um, speaking in other tongues was only a sign to Peter and John that the Samaritans could now get saved. But actually, when we read that whole chapter in context, it wasn't a sign that they could get saved. It was a sign that they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the biblical understanding of what tongues is a sign for. And it's a sign today as well for anyone who's been filled with the Holy Spirit. When they're filled, they begin speaking in other tongues. So let's start at verse 5 to set the context. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And then jump to verse 12. It says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So here, the people of Samaria... Uh, that were present here, they uh, believed what Philip was preaching, the kingdom, gospel of the kingdom, and so they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Simon, he was a sorcerer, 
and he did he had bewitched the people for a long time and uh with with sorcery Simon himself believed also so he believed also and when he was baptized he continued with Philip and wondered beholding the miracles and signs which were done so even Philip believed and was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and then verse 14 says now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God they sent unto them Peter and John so when they had heard that they had received the word of God, meaning it doesn't say that they were born again, they had received the word of God. They had repented, they had um, believed what, what, what Philip preached, and were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So, But yet they had not received the Holy Spirit, and we're going to learn how we know that in the next few verses. We've got to read everything in context and read the entire passage. Verse 15 says, Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now here, this, tell, this tells us that they knew that they had not yet received the Holy Ghost. They, 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 there was something that was lacking. They, they had, the, the sign was not given that someone had received the Holy Ghost. And verse 16 confirms that. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had been baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So... This is really important to, to uh, uh, just see what's going on here. If it was only a sign to the apostles to let them know that the Samaritans could now get saved, as this person um, uh, implies or want, wants me to believe, then why didn't they receive the Holy Ghost when they believed? And then when Peter and John were sent down to them, they just began speaking in other tongues when they laid their hands on them to receive the sign of confirmation that they had already received the Holy Ghost. But you don't, you don't see that. What you see is they didn't receive the Holy Spirit until af after Peter and John arrived and laid hands on them. And after they received the Holy Spirit, that's when they began to speak in other tongues. Now here it doesn't say that they spoke in other tongues. So many make a point of this and try to say, oh, look, they didn't speak in other tongues. It doesn't say they did, so they, they never did. But we got to remember, we got to look at the Word of God in its entirety. We got to rightly divide the Word of truth. We got to look at all the examples through the book of Acts. And then we also need to recognize how things come together in the Word of God. For example, when we read, when we read uh, the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, regarding various different uh, aspects, let's say, of the crucifixion. Matthew writes a little differently than Mark. Mark writes a little differently than Luke, and Luke writes a little differently than Matthew and Mark. But even though they may not include all the details that the other person included and, and left out a few uh, things, it doesn't mean that, uh, for instance, if, if Luke le left a certain detail out that Mark included, that, that, that we can write Mark's... Um, uh, detail off as if it never happened. We need to look at all of it to see that when we put them all together, we can come to a right conclusion about the crucifixion and all that took place. And the skeptics have tried to tear apart the Bible or the Gospels and th therefore the whole Bible um, by doing that. But ultimately, when you look at, when you, when you break it all down and look at all the accounts, they all line up if you understand the, the details of what is being said there. So, um, there's people who have answered the skeptics on all the gospel accounts and, and where they say that there's differences or like in, uh, one, one account's in error and the other one contradicts. Uh, it's been proven that there's no contradiction in any of the gospels, that they all uh, line up uh, perfectly. So same thing with this example in Acts um, chapter 8. When we recognize that the Holy Spirit um, they, that the apostles knew that uh, the Samaritans had not yet received the Holy Spirit because they had not obviously received that, that sign, that confirmation um, that they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. So when they laid their hands on them, then the apostles knew that they had received the Holy Ghost. So there's obviously something that happened when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. There was a sign that, that, that confirmed not only to um, Peter and John, but also to the Samaritans. Um, and I, I, it's not just a sign for the first century Jews and the apostles. When someone's filled with the Holy Ghost, it's a sign for themselves. They've received that seal of promise. When I was filled with the Holy Spirit, began speaking in other tongues, 
that was that was a sign for me as well as as those around me and uh to to just say that it was it's a sign for the first century Jews there's no uh warrant for that in all of scripture to say that um so the reason i i, I feel it, that the context of this chapter 8 um tells us that uh they began speaking in other tongues is because in verse 18 when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now, if all that took place was they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and then the Samaritans were just there in silence, like, you know, like many people today teach, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it happens just upon belief, and there's no sign or anything. It's not a powerful experience at all. You're just filled with the Holy Spirit because you believe. Um... Why would Simon offer money for something like that? Obviously, he it was such a powerful sign that he was convinced, like, wow, this is this is worth paying money for. If I have this power, I could make money off of it. So obviously, Simon's heart was wrong in thinking that way, and that's why Peter said in verse twenty, "Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money." And so this implies that it was speaking in other tongues. When we compare this with Acts chapter ten. Acts chapter uh, 19, all the, all the evidence of speaking in other tongues being the sign that someone's been filled with the Holy Spirit, that's how we rightly divide the word of truth and come to a biblical conclusion on these things. So and another point I think needs to be made is that this person writes that the Samaritans get saved, but they don't receive the Holy Ghost. Now, Simon was part of this group that supposedly, according to this person, got saved. But from the from the context, we recognize that be, to be born again, you need to be born of the water and the Spirit. Simon never was born of the Spirit. He was only he only supposedly believed and was baptized in the name of Jesus. But I even question, I question whether he truly repented before baptism. Um, his heart was off. His heart was wrong. He offered to, to, to uh, buy the Holy Ghost, the, the power that the apostles had. And, um, and then... Peter said, thy money perish with thee. So obviously his heart was wrong. He was not born again. He needed to repent. Um, if, his, if, his, if he had truly repented before his baptism, he needs to repent now and, and seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, at that time, I, I, I'm acting like he's, he's currently alive, but you get my point. Um, so I think those are some points that need to be uh, mentioned about Acts chapter 8. And then we'll jump to Acts chapter 10, which is this person writes that uh, God moves heaven and earth to get Peter and John to go to Cornelius and the Gentiles. They get saved and God shows Peter and John and the six Jews with them a sign that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Gentiles now can get saved. It blows their minds. So again, here we have um, Gentiles. Uh, yes, they're, they're getting saved, not because they just believed in Jesus, but they're actually born again. But they're not born again when they're filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 10, verse 44. They're born again when they're filled with the Holy Ghost and then get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we got to remember, getting to be in order to be saved, you need to be born again. You can't, you can't be saved without being born again. And being born again is being born of the water and the Spirit. They, the, those two agree in one salvation experience. So, um, uh, before dealing with their next point, I'll, I'll just continue to point out that the sign of speaking in other tongues was not a sign to the apostles to let, any, uh, to let them know that now a certain group of people could get saved. It was a sign to let them know they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what it's always, the context is always when that, when they speak in other tongues, it always has to do with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, not, not a sign that someone could get saved. Um, and we know that in, in Acts chapter 10, that Peter had already received the vision from God to let Peter know that the Gentiles could now get saved. That's what the beginning of Acts chapter 10 is about. 
And so in verse 34, Peter already knew that, and that's why he says, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, meaning salvation is not by race, but by grace. And both Jew and Gentile have to enter in the same way through Jesus Christ by obeying the gospel that the apostles preached. And so when we understand that, we can see that it's a dangerous thing to say that it, um, the, the Holy Ghost, when it was um, the, the sign of speaking in other tongues were given, that that was just letting the apostles and the, the Jews of that time know that the Gentiles could now get saved. Rather, the context says that it's a sign that they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Big difference, because we've we got to recognize born again as being born of the water and of the Spirit. So they weren't born again when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I hope you're following my, 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 my train of thought. They were born again after they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now they're born of the water and of the Spirit. So let's read from verse 42 all the way to verse 48 in Acts chapter 10. So it says, um, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead, refer referring to Jesus. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now remember in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and Luke 24 47, remission of sins is preached in the name of Jesus. But Peter preaches the gospel and obeys Jesus' commands in Luke 24, 47 by, by saying that you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So that's how we receive remission of sins. And so, um, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word, the Logos. Those that heard the gospel that the apostles preached, the, immediately the Holy Ghost fell on them. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And how did they know that the, the gift of the Holy Ghost was poured out? Verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So here, the sign that they had been filled with the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. Not the sign that they had been born again or saved. The sign that they had been filled with the Holy Ghost. So they have been, they've been born of the Spirit at this point. And then that's why Peter says in verse 47, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So they received the Holy Ghost in the same manner that they had. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. There you have it. So those who were baptized in the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues, who were then baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, those who did that were now born again. But until they did that, they weren't born again. They weren't born of the water and of the Spirit until they actually obeyed Peter's command. So that's critical to understand about the context of Acts chapter 10. So the person then goes on to say um, that uh, the Jews consider the Gentiles dogs. True. In fact, Peter has to run all the way back to Jerusalem to convene a council to sort out what happened. Peter convinces the Jewish Christian leaders that the Gentiles can enter the New Covenant and the sign is not needed anymore. Well, okay, he confirms that uh, the Gentiles did receive the Holy Spirit because they received the sign when someone's filled with the Holy Spirit. But this idea that the sign is not needed anymore is, is made, it's, that, that's made up. That's, that's a thought, an invention of man. Nowhere in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 11, anywhere through the rest of the Acts and any of the epistles in the New Testament say that at all. So where's the authority from the Word of God to make such a, such a bold statement that's in such error? There's, there's no warrant for it. And then this person brings up another point by saying, in fact, I don't think the Bible provides any more examples except in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 to disciples that already believed long ago, showing that their belief was of God. So when we turn to Acts chapter 19, I actually, I mentioned this in the be beginning of this video, I think that the fact that there are Jews who begin speaking in other tongues um, here, this is many, many years after that 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 original um, 
uh, sign given given to the apostles and the and the Jews of that time that the Gentiles and Samaritans could enter the uh, the new covenant through obeying the the gospel, and then now you have Jews who had um, obeyed the uh, what John was, John the Baptist was preaching and was baptized unto repentance for the remission of their sins, come across and meet the apostle Paul. Now, if the sign had already been given that both Jews, Samaritan, or that Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles could now be saved, the sign was already given. Why would there be any more need for a sign? And the truth is, there wouldn't be any more need for a sign. But in Acts 19, you read that, there, that, that the sign was still being given to let people know that they had received the Holy Ghost. And so in, in Acts 19... Uh, it, and starting at verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism, John the Baptist. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So, there, and then it says in verse 7, all men were about 12. So here 12 men heard the gospel. Uh, the apostles preach, even though they had been baptized uh, by John the Baptist, they needed to enter the new covenant. They were not born again until this moment when they obeyed the gospel that, that the apostle Paul preached. And they received the same sign that they had been filled with the Holy Spirit that the, that the Jews uh, at the very beginning in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost had received, um, the Samaritans in Acts 8 and the Gentiles in Acts 10. Same exact sign. And so it all adds up beautifully to show that even probably 10 or even more, 15 years after Acts 8 and Acts 10, that, that the occurrence there, this is when this happened. If you, if you understand how long Paul's journey was before he started going and preaching the gospel. So um, when we recognize that, we can see that, that uh, um, and what was said by this person, uh, their belief was of God, yes, but it didn't mean that they were born again. They needed to obey the gospel under the new covenant. And John the Baptist's um, uh, baptism was only during that transition, transitionary period from old covenant to new covenant. That Once the new covenant was established uh, in, in Jesus' blood, we need to have the blood of Jesus applied to our lives. And it happens when we obey the gospel, when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Filled, and then filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. So, I'll continue on then. Um, and then this person writes, uh, History does not really provide any other examples. The gifts seem to disappear after 70 AD. So, um, history does not appear to provide any other examples. Again, um, does not appear or does not really provide, doesn't mean that history doesn't. It just means that it's not the majority. And again, if we're always looking to the majority to see the answer, well, how could the majority be wrong? The majority of believers. We're not reading our Bibles. The Bible makes it clear that the majority is usually wrong. And so we need to get, get, get out of that mindset and just take God at his word. Receive the word of God, what God is saying through his word. Um, and that... The gifts seem to disappear after 70 AD. Again, what seems to happen doesn't mean that, that that's what actually has happened. Um, just because the gifts aren't in the limelight throughout history does not mean that they disappear. Um, again, we need to go back to the Great Commission of uh, what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16. Um, about, I've already dealt with uh, the gifts ceasing um, being an error in the passage of scripture that, that people use to teach that um, and, and why that was wrong. But when we turn to Mark 16, this is undeniable what Jesus said. So regardless of whether you want to try to make 
uh, the gifts cease through one little passage of scripture that you're um, twisting. Um, we need to look, recognize Jesus' words in Mark 16 that a little child can understand um, if you just read it as a little child without preconceived ideas and traditions of men, denominational glasses on. Just let all that go aside and allow God's Jesus to speak to you right here in Mark 16, verse 15. And this is what Jesus said to uh, his apostles. It says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Um, very uh, easy to understand that if you're going to be saved, you need to believe and be baptized. So you need to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost is a promise. So that's why you'll be saved. But if you don't believe, you're never going to get baptized. So you're never going to receive remission of sins. And if you don't believe and are baptized for whatever reason, you're just doing it uh, because someone else, in, like your, uh, your spouse did it or uh, a friend did it, but there's no belief and repentance beforehand, all you did was get wet. So belief needs to come first. Repentance, baptism, and then you're promised to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it says... In verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. So reading this as a little child, taking it for what 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 his words say, Jesus' words say, these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, he didn't say some that believe, and or some of these signs shall follow them that believe. It says these signs, like all these signs, shall follow all those that believe. Not up until a certain point. In general, whoever believes the apostles' message, the gospel, whoever believes it, obviously belief is obeying that gospel, that this, these are the signs that will follow. In my name shall they cast out devils. So every born-again believer has the ability and power through the name of Jesus to cast out devils. So we need to be doing what Jesus said. And in fact, it, it, there, there, there's people that w are walking in the commands of Jesus um, all throughout history and, and to modern times today. And they, they, in the name of Jesus, they see devils cast out of people. They're set free. Now they can, um, uh, uh, many times people can't even really think straight. They got all these thoughts in their head. And until they're delivered of, of these devils, they, they, they're not really able to even um, think straight enough to, uh, to repent and, and be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. So we need to cast devils out. That's, that's something that we're commanded to do. So um, these, in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. There you have it. Here tongues is for everyone, the sign that, that follows everyone who believes. So there's the initial infilling of the Holy Ghost where the sign is, that you've been filled is speaking in other tongues, but then you, everyone who's been filled with the Holy Spirit can, has a prayer language now from God where you can speak in tongues to edify yourself, not just the gift of tongues in a church setting where you um, speak in tongues and then someone in, who has the gift of interpretation of tongues interprets that message so that the whole body is edified. I'm talking about when you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you now can speak in other tongues as you pray to God. And by doing that, you edify yourself. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. And then there's divine protection when it says they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. When we're in God's service, and we're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, we're seeing, seeing people's lives transformed through the gospel as they obey the gospel and are set free, um, that we, we're, we're, we're promised divine protection. God is, God is with us. And it says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In the name of Jesus, a born-again believer in the name of Jesus can command healing to a broken bone, to sickness and disease, blindness, whatever it is, um, and that, that, that person shall recover. So we need to be walking in the commands of Jesus here. These signs shall follow them that believe, the apostles' doctrine. So when we're born again, we need to grow from, from newborn babes to mature believers in Christ obeying the commands of Jesus here that that was never he never told them that it would stop at a certain point that these things were only for a certain 
uh, generation uh, of Jews. Rather, these signs shall follow them that believe. So we can't forget Jesus' words in the Great Commission. And speaking in tongues just happens to be right there for all to see. And it can't be denied. Um, so again, the same word or logos um, that the apostles preached is how we believe on Jesus through the apostles' word, like John 17, 20 tells us. We, we, we believe on Jesus through the, their word, the apostles' word. And um, that's what places us on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. It's the same, same foundation as on the day of Pentecost that those Jews who believed were placed on top of. And it's the same exact foundation that, that we today, when we obey the gospel, we as lively stones are placed on that same foundation. We enter the exact same way through the exact same gospel that the apostles preached. And we got a warning for anyone who preaches any, any different gospel than what they, they preached. In Galatians chapter 1, it's, he says, uh, and there, there were some that obviously had been shaken by a different gospel. That's why he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And it's such an important statement that he says it again. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And so it's a very strong warning for anyone who's going to twist the gospel, anyone who's going to take what the apostles preached, that we learn all about through the book of Acts, and say, guess what? All you need to do is believe in Jesus. Mentally acknowledge that Jesus existed, ask him into your heart, and you're, and you're born again, you're saved. Um, where's repentance? They, repentance wasn't even mentioned. Um, if you take uh, water out of it, like water baptism, all of a sudden you're preaching a different gospel. If you say that water baptism is only uh, an outward sign of an inward work, you know, then you're changing what baptism accomplishes. If you say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens automatically upon belief, you're not going by what the apostles taught. And so we need to recognize that repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and being filled with the Holy Spirit with a sign of speaking in other tongues, that's what the apostles taught. That's the gospel that needs to go forth today and is going forth today, has, has continued to go forth since the apostles preached that um, uh, on the day of Pentecost. So we need to recognize that just because the majority or the limelight hasn't been on those people, um, throughout history doesn't mean that they never existed. God has always had a remnant. He's always had a people for his name. And in fact, I, I would say that right now, there's more people uh, that believe in the gospel the apostles preached, have obeyed it, and are preaching that gospel probably than any other time in history. If you start looking worldwide, um, there's amazing things happening. People are being set free, transformed by the, the, the gospel. When they obey the gospel, are set free in Christ. And they're going out and actually uh, seeing uh, people healed, devils cast out. Exactly what the book of Acts talks about. So the book of Acts is to be continued today. It's the only book in the New Testament that doesn't end with the word, Amen. Look up every other uh, book in the New Testament. It ends with am, amen, except for the book of Acts. I take that as a sign to mean that it's, it, it, it's to continue. The gospel of the kingdom, the same gospel that the apostles preach is supposed to be preached today. The same sign given when someone's been sealed with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. So then I want to talk about hindrances in receiving the Holy Spirit. And I, I want This is probably the most important part of this video because there's a lot of people out there who have uh, sincerely repented. They've sincerely been uh, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the, the remission of their sins, understanding what water baptism accomplishes. But they have not yet received the Holy Spirit. They have not yet spoken in other tongues, uh, be, and that being the sign that they have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just want to encourage those people to, to not give up hope, 
to not beat yourself up and look down upon yourself as if something's wrong with you. There's a lot of things that could hinder that from happening. Um, and this is going to be about trust, trusting the Lord. Do we trust God? Do you trust God uh, to give you the Holy Ghost? Because God wants to give us the Holy Ghost. That's what he, he, he wants to give us the Holy Ghost. So we need to understand a few things uh, about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So I want to deal with uh, the hindrances, and then I want to uh, uh, go over a few examples um, of people that I know who've received the Holy Ghost um, you know, long after that they were baptized. So um, a lack of trust is, is, is a major hindrance. When, you're, when you obey the gospel through repentance and, and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, you need to trust in Jesus. Your focus needs to be on what he accomplished for you, what he's done for you in water baptism. And if you come up out of that water, just because you don't start speaking in other tongues does, does not mean that your baptism wasn't for the remission of sins. You're, you have been uh, born of the water, just not born of the Spirit, but you're on a path and God will seal you with the Holy Spirit because it's a promise to those who have truly repented and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Your faith just needs to continue to be in Christ and all that he's done for you. So trust him and understand that God wants to give you his spirit. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit. So focus on him, on Jesus and what he's done. Don't focus on yourself. In fact, some people, uh, what, what hinders some people is that they focus on their own good works that uh, maybe, maybe that they're not, they have, haven't been a uh, good enough person. Um, they're lacking in what they've done for the Lord in order to receive the Holy Spirit. That's going to hinder you because none of us receive the Holy Spirit because we deserve it. None of us receive the Holy Spirit because uh, of our, our, our own righteousness. The Bible says very clear that our own righteousness is as filthy rags in God's sight. It's only through the blood of Jesus that we can receive the Holy Spirit. And so God sees us through the blood of Jesus if we've repented, truly repented, and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He sees us washed, cleansed, clean. Um, so he, but he wants our, our, our hearts and our understanding to, to be enlightened with the truth because he wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. So if we focus on our good works rather than on what Jesus accomplished, that's going to hinder us from receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to recognize that the the only way that we um, could even be provided with salvation is because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. It's what he earned for us. And so that the focus needs to be on Jesus and Jesus alone and that um, all your sins, have, if you've been uh, baptized in the name of Jesus, all your sins have been washed away. You're clean. So even though you may remember your sins, God has chosen to forget your sins. So he sees you through the blood of Jesus. That's really important. That should encourage those of you who are looking at your past and how um, you don't feel like you're, you're good enough for, for God. You need to see yourself as good enough, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Another hindrance is that uh, some people are afraid to praise and worship God. So giving God their entire, their whole heart. And if we're afraid to praise and worship God, and we're concerned about what other, may, other people may think, or um, we just have uh, too many other carnal thoughts in our minds, uh, we need to take every thought captive. We need to uh, get rid of all the, the cares of this world. Focus on Jesus. Worship Him with a whole heart. Give your whole heart to Him. And, and ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Seek, continue to seek, and you shall find. Ask, and you will receive. So don't be afraid to praise and worship God. In fact, my testimony is that after I came, come up out of the water in uh, being baptized in the name of Jesus, I immediately felt so, so light, like all the, the, the weight of my sins that I've been carrying, even as a believer in Jesus throughout my, my youth, were now finally lifted and washed away in, in, in baptism. And so out of that, I just felt I needed to praise God. So I lifted my hands to God, and I just started praising and worshiping Him. And as I, I was worshiping Him, obviously, in, 
uh, in English. That's the language I speak. And out of that came um, speaking in, in, in a new tongue that as the Spirit gave me utterance. So that was powerful. That, that was awesome. But it came for me, it came by me um, first um, worshiping God in my own language. And then God was able, and I was giving him my whole heart to surrendering everything to him. And then he was able to uh, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I began speaking in other tongues. So uh, another hindrance is not surrendering completely. Surrender everything over to him. Give all your cares over to him. Know that he loves you. And how much he loves you, so much so um, what 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 he did on uh, on the cross for you, and um, allow that love to really teach you and uh, um, do something in your heart, and then out of that will come your praise and, and your worship, and cast out all fear. Um, many people are afraid. Oh, what what's going to happen? Oh, oh, you know, so they have this fear, and the enemy, uh, the fear is from the enemy. So we need to cast out all fear in the name of Jesus. And so those are a few things that I think will help people who have, um, uh, yeah, they, they've, they've truly repented. They've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins, but they have not quite, uh, or they have not yet been filled with the Holy Spirit and received the sign that they've been filled, that of speaking in other tongues. Um, just remember, God will never take control. He's not like, um, the de like uh, demons who will possess people and take control of people. Um, we need to give him our heart. We need to surrender all to him and, and give him control. Uh, that's a, a, the loving God that, that we serve. And uh, just another example is my mom. She, when she was um, uh, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, a lot later on in her life, she'd been baptized earlier in her life in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and wanted to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to, to, to obey what the apostles commanded. When she came up out of the water, she never spoke spoke in other tongues. And in fact, a, uh, over a year went by um, before she she did. And it happened in a very unique way. And uh, she was all by herself, and she was quite sick. And she began um, just pouring her heart out to God, just crying out to God, like and worshiping God. Just felt this amazing need to worship God and cry out to God. And out of that. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in a beautiful language to God. And it just lifted everything um, uh, that she was experienced there. And, and it was an amazing thing that she'll never forget. So, um, yeah, and I know people that have gone even longer. Now, I don't think it's it needs to be delayed. I don't think, I just think that there's so much uh, that, that hinders God from baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. That if we learn a few things, um, it can take away those hindrances and God will fill us. But we need to know a few things. We need to also remember that having other people who have already received the Holy Spirit, been born again, to lay hands on us and pray for us, um, that that can in increase our faith and encourage us. So that's a biblical way as well. If, if you haven't received, continue to, to seek and continue to have people pray for you. And remember, it's a promise. God will fill you with this Holy Spirit. He's got, your life is secure in Christ. You've already put on Christ in water baptism. You just need to now be born of the Spirit. So don't look at yourself as condemned or anything like that. That's not what the Word of God is communicating to you. You just need to seek to be filled. And I'll end on this note. If we turn to Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 9. Jesus says, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So continue to ask Him. But remember, you can't, you have to, if, if you're, um, yeah, if, you're, if all these things are hindering, you don't feel like asking. So you, you need to remember all these things. You need to get to a place, renew your mind through the Word of God what the Word of God says about what happened when you were baptized. 
remember to that to it, to see yourself as God sees you through the blood of Jesus, rather than on um, oh well, how good I I ha have been or haven't been. You need to recognize you can't be living a life in sin. That that's going to hinder you you from being filled. When after your baptism, you need to live a life of victory in Christ. So that's really important. So just re remember that your sins are, have been washed away, and you need to continue to live a repentant life in Christ. And you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. So I hope that encourages you. And uh, just continue to seek and you shall find. And if um, there, there, are, there, there is a rare occasion where when someone was baptized in the name of Jesus, they haven't received the Holy Spirit, haven't received the Holy Spirit, they need to examine whether they truly uh, believed, had, had faith in Jesus, and, and truly repented before their baptism. And make sure that their baptism was done in the name of Jesus, not in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So anyway, I'll end this here and I'll do the last video of the series regarding the church fathers and why we can't depend on them as the foundation um, of the church. All right. God bless. I'll see you in the next video.